We have heard the term computer freaks, and for our first speaker, I don't want to add this negative connotation because this is a man who, in the time where kilobytes were very hard to come by, would program in such a way that his screensaver didn't use up any, well, that he used a screensaver that used the least amount of memory. That's how this man treats his kilobytes. Uh, I want to introduce and warmly welcome our first speaker of tonight, Hils van Aanzer. Okay. 
And uh, <coughs> so the, the problem was that uh, this is not standard. So, well, how are you going to do that? Yeah? So, well, there were some people at the university who had a scanner, so I managed to scan in the picture. And then the problem was how to make uh, that into a pattern that my mother could use. And the other problem was how to get the wool in the proper colors. And so scanning, uh, so, so making the picture, I had to make my own, basically, uh, tapestry editor. <laughs> and now well, that worked, because the problem is, that if, for instance, if you have here a leg like that of the horse, and you scan it in, then you have all kinds of little squares that are half black and half white, so they become gray. That doesn't look very nice. So you have to start telling for each of those whether they should be black or white and then make it look decent. The saddle here looked awful in the original version, so you have to do a lot of editing there. There were Japanese characters here, which I edited out because nothing of that survived. There was also something here. And so on. And then to get the wool, that was also not very easy because I found a shop where they were selling all this kind of material for, uh, uh, for making tapestries. But they had only two of the 22 colors available that were usable. That was black. <laughs> one color, uh, one other color, I forget which one. And like for instance, I wanted to have a special type of brown for the horse. Oh no, 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 horses, we always do in this color brown. <laughs> so that was not the solution. And so then somebody told me that if you went to the textile museum in Tilburg, if they would be interested in the project, they might paint the wool for you. And so the thing that happened was that I had to go to Tilburg quite a few times before the wool was painted. <laughs> and, and, but, so this is the type of pattern that my mother wanted to have. It's called a counting pattern. So it's 24 pages like that. <laughs> and uh, so there are letters in there, and then she likes that. So each letter represents a color. And, uh, and then she has to put a knot there in the corresponding place. And she had made many tapestries because also for, for the carpets on the floor when we were little. So, well, okay, this, I, I still found this back. So this was the original picture in the book. And this is what it became. But the thing is, this picture uh, happens to have very light colors because probably it has been in the sun for some time because I have also another picture of this, uh, this print which is much darker in the other book. It's a, a picture by a very famous Japanese poet, uh, from around 1830. It's a Chinese poet in the show. So it was very easy to make that editor actually, because uh, in those days the next step operating system existed. Uh, that was a system that was made by Steve Jobs, the guy of Apple, who at that moment had left Apple and started a new company called Next. And uh, he made a whole new generation of computers, but somehow he didn't manage to sell it very well. So eventually the company was bought up by Apple, and they used a lot of uh, pieces of this next step operating system to make the Apple operating system uh, much better. And then, okay, oh, there we go again. Okay, uh, then I had to go to, to Tilburg 22 times before all the colors were correct. They still have in the museum there lots of colors and colors to show how many colors there can be that are basically trials from, from this room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next topic, bookshelves. Uh, many of you will probably have some bookshelves in your apartment that were bought at Ikea. <laughs> So did I for a while, and of course they are very handy, they are not so expensive, but on the other hand they are not really that beautiful either. Eh? So at a certain moment I wanted to have something better, but I didn't know where to go get them, so then you want to make something yourself, but then you have to get a good design or so. And then one day I was walking in the Colonel Muller Museum, uh, that's near Arnhem, in the Hoge Veluwe, and I saw this painting by Mondrian. 
And I look at it and I think, hey, that would make a very clear bit of a second bookshelf. Two <laughs> <laughs> little short cuttings from bookshelves because you have like here these little corners hidden. And uh, things like this isn't very handy for bookshelves. But okay, so you play a little bit around with the design, of course. But to make a kind of chaotic bookshelves, this looks very great. Yeah? So then you start thinking how I'm going to do that. And you have to get wood and so on. And you have to design some kind of way of putting wood together in a, in, in a way that it's not a standard way of making bookshelves. So you figure out a way where you uh, use a router, that's a place in Dutch, uh, to make grooves in the wood. And you, you make that this fits in there so that it will be very solid. And then you make some other grooves and you stick a back panel in there so that it, uh, it cannot wobble anymore and so on. And so then, so this, this is how, for instance, that joint works. Yeah. Yeah. So this one here fits in here. <laughs> And it looks quite good, especially when you push it all the way in, you don't even notice that this is there. You don't even see that. And then you make a design. This is a computer, of course. And so the computer automatically prints all those numbers there also, so that you know a little bit. And I had some more drawings like that, but I'll show you everything. And so this is basically what the file looks like that made that picture. Type <laughs> and, uh, and then you have to go buy your wood. And uh, yeah, in Amsterdam is very fortunate. There is a very good shop for that in the in the, in the best best harbor. And so this, this, this is a unpaid commercial. <laughs> and so I got some very nice massive oak wood of. Uh, Two centimeters uh, thick and some almost 30 centimeters wide. And so then I buy some. Whenever I do a project like that, I buy some new tools because, of course, I'm basically a big child. And uh, well, the bigger the child, the bigger the toys. Yeah? <laughs> and, uh, and so it all fits together like a puzzle no glue, no nails, and just a few screws at the top to hold the whole thing together. And that was a good idea because I made most of this stuff when I was in a previous apartment and then I had to move and the whole thing came apart into little pieces of wood and, uh, and I could move it all. And so, uh, unfortunately it's a little bit dark here, uh, these pictures. So this is uh, the construction of, uh, of those bookshelves, the beginning part of it. And this is where it is finished, from the same angle. And then from another angle, you see a little bit better what it looks like. Yeah, so it's a, a little bit irregular. And nowhere are there crosses. Yeah, so there are only joints of, of uh, where, where three lines come together, but nowhere four. And so that looks very nice. Mm. I have another one here on the other side. Which you have a little movie that... Uh, that, that that we start made. Well, we try to see whether we can play that. Okay, final subject. 
I was told to uh, to do well. Basically, I'm, I'm quoting here Henry VIII to his wife. Yeah, I won't keep you long. So making your own pseudo. So I'm not afraid of that either. And there was a good motivation for this. I had a little pseudo machine which uh, kept me busy because I was lying at the toilet. So. Every time a pseudo poop, till by mistake my wife walked into the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, so that was out of out of commission. So then I had to try to find a new supply of pseudo poop, but they didn't sell that in the machine anymore. So then I decided to try to make my own. And so the one of the problems is that the normal sets of pseudo poops are not really that interesting. They're really too easy. And uh, so I had a, uh, I, I bought a book by uh, the by the Roman, by the Times with fiendishly difficult Sudokus and there were indeed a few that I couldn't solve, but I was a bit suspicious about it. So then I wrote a program actually <laughs> uh, to try to solve them. And, but the, the the challenge here was to do it in this language, in the language of this uh, symbolic manipulation program. And I managed to do that. That was part of it. And uh, it was a bit slow. It took like three or four seconds to solve this. So <laughs> well, for a computer, that's slow, yeah. And then uh, I was this summer, this, this spring, I was uh, in Karlsruhe for a month. And in the evening, I was sitting in the hotel. And I was getting bored a little bit. And I decided to, uh, to make my own serious program to make difficult Sudokus. So I needed a program that could create them and that could solve them. And so I studied a little bit also on the internet what they were doing there. There are some sites, like there is one that's called Extreme Sudoku, and they give every day five new Sudokus with classifications as extreme and whatever else. And then it turns out that the program didn't consider them really that difficult. <laughs> because I have some classifications about what is difficult, and the ones uh, that Lisa is uh, handling out at the moment are all more difficult than those. There's a place called Sudo to Snake, which explains lots of techniques. If you ever want to learn how to solve Sudokus, that's a very nice place to start on the internet. But then making your own was actually fun and then to see how difficult I could get them. But in such a way that in principle you can still solve them by hand and if you don't need a computer for it. It's just that I could use them by computer. So now, how do you do that? Now I think I'm not giving all the details here of course. So if you create a, fi a, a valid final position, then you take away numbers randomly. And after each number that you take out, you check that there's still only a single solution. And then, till at a certain moment, at, till at a certain moment, you cannot take more numbers out, and then you check whether the program can still solve it with all the techniques that you have programmed in it. And then you determine how difficult it is. That's actually not so easy to do that. And so, about 80% of what you generate is where the program solves, and the other one that is all the way. And what do you, do you really want? Well, you want to make very difficult ones. You want to have a program that can solve them and show graphically how it has solved it, so that you know what is happening. Yeah? I'll show you a little example. You want to have control over the tricks that are needed, so that if you don't like a certain trick, that you just don't let the computer accept those. Yeah? You don't want to accept pseudo that can be solved without that thing. And to make a book that, uh, that I can make automatically, I generate a few hundred of those things. I put, uh, I put them in the file and I have a book. Yeah? <laughs> well, that's the proper way, yeah? automatic book generation. So the program can generate a few hundred Sudokus per second, but it only keeps the very difficult ones. And so, for instance, what Lisa has for handing out, there are 40 different ones there. And they were the result of generating 216 million of those things. Yeah. And for the book, I have a, a data set with more than a billion of them. 
So, yeah, well, sometimes you have a computer standing empty, so you don't have to So, if you want to solve one, this, is, uh, this was number 41 out of the set, the one that Lisa doesn't have out. So, I, I, uh, I get that out in this notation, and now the program can read it in, in this notation, and then solve it. It took 22 milliseconds to solve it and to make it. Uh, a, fi a final 5,000 lines with explaining how it's solved it. So you get something like this. This is uh, what I'm going to finish with. So you get something like this is one that tells you I put the four here, I put the there, there, and so on. And then it looks into the trick that it needs. So it tells exactly what trick it needed, and so on, and so that it goes, 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 goes. This is a difficult signal, so I told you that. So, it keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and going. So if you can solve this yourself, then you will be quite deep. Yeah? <laughs> so it has all, all kinds of tricks here. They all have a name. And hop, 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 hop. And now it drops through. And the end. And then it explains in text what it has been. Okay, so that was all I wanted to tell about my hobbies. Yeah, so you see that uh, I keep myself busy with all kinds of things. And maybe that is a uh, good, well, that was one of the definitions of nerves, uh, that you can keep yourself busy. <laughs> Of course, everybody has a pen with him, so in the break of the night, uh, you can finish your Sudokus, and I guess uh, this is going to be trivial for all of you. So, I'm sure there are some questions for Jos. If you have a question, raise your hand now. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, you said you were playing Go earlier on, and then you said you have a certain level. Uh, I don't know anything about the Go levels, but I'm quite interested. Okay, well, uh, let's say I played, I, I played in the tournament for the Dutch Championship several times, and my best result was number four. And I've been number six, I've been number eight, I've been last number 12 in the European Championships. But uh, and uh, nowadays players are a little bit stronger, so I would probably rank in the Netherlands now as a matter of our position between 20 and 25, probably, something like that. But you had a name for it? For the Down. For the Down. For the Down. Well, in Japan, in Japan uh, they have rankings, and Down basically means great. And like in Judo, you have one Down, two Down, all the way to nine Down. Nine Down is the hardest. And in Go, they have two systems of ranking. They have Dance for amateurs and dance for professionals. The professional dance are much stronger than the amateur dance, but uh, okay, so I'm an amateur. But on the on the Dutch scale, I was a rather strong player when I was playing, and I would have to study a little bit to uh, to play there again. But okay, so uh, at the moment I'm too busy with so many other things. But there are uh, quite a few people who you probably classify as nerds who are quite good strong both players. Yeah. So how long do you think is it going to go? I mean, how long does one game? How long does one game? How long is one game? I think that it can be like for months. <laughs> no, 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 that is a very good exception. There has been a game in Japan, which is a very famous game that was before World War II. Which took, which took uh, quite a few months. That was uh, a very old man who had been the champion and a, 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 young, a, a, a young player who had introduced all kinds of new techniques and so and they wanted to see how that matched against each other. But, so they would play for a few hours and then the old player would get tired and they would adjourn and it might take a week before they would play again or so. And, and so that lasted quite a few months. Uh, but uh, the normal thing is, if you go to a go club here in Amsterdam, is that you play games that last a few of an hour, or you can play faster, or you can play slower. If you go to the Dutch Championship, they play two games in one day. And uh, in the European Championships, nowadays I think they play one game per day. Uh, so then you have a few hours per person, like with chess. 
Uh, but you have also tournaments where you play fast. You know, like you get only like 10 or 15 minutes per person uh, for a game. Then you have to play really fast. And that requires an enormous uh, uh, effort of your, from your intuition. Because you just don't have time to really think out everything. Ever so, you, basically you agree upon a time. And if you want to play fast, you play fast. And if you want to play slow, you play slow. Usually the games that take like half an hour each or so are the most interesting ones because it moves, yeah, and you don't get too bored. If your opponent starts thinking for an hour, that's very boring. <laughs> now, if you are a player also, I have once been in a game where my opponent took for a move 40 minutes, then and for the next move he would took more than 50 minutes. And but look, you have looked at that situation, you don't know what he's going to do, you cannot think out everything, and you want to maintain your, uh, your concentration, you don't know when he's going to move, so it becomes a bit boring. Yeah? <laughs> It's a little bit about Go, because oh, yeah. you could try combining your fondness for algorithms with Go, because it is a notorious, difficult problem to solve yeah. for computers. Several times, but I have never made a complete program, but I have helped a little bit with uh, somebody who did have a complete program with a few techniques. But, uh, hmm? No, I well, think this is very easy. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, the, the, these programs are not very strong. Nowadays, they have some new techniques that are so-called Monte Carlo techniques, where they try, uh, try out a lot of positions randomly. And they have had some game where a professional Go player played against the computer. The computer got nine stones ahead, which is a, a handicap, and was playing on, I think, 10,000 processors. And, and the computer managed to win it. But that is a, a unique feat, in a sense. But so, usually, if you take the strongest programs, then it, I can give them quite a few strong handicaps and still problems. There was a question at the back? Yes. Um, so, first of all, I like, really like the design of your cupboard uh, in the beginning of the talk. And I was wondering, like, nerds don't really care about such worldly things as money. But on the other hand, there's also a few of them, like Bill Gates, who got really rich with it. So I was wondering, have you ever considered selling the design of your cover to IKEA? <laughs> no, no, no. Not really to sell it to IKEA. That, uh, I have no idea how they would go about it. They would probably look at it and then steal it, but okay. Uh, <laughs> Since the idea is rather simple, then. and uh, well, yeah, with money, I'm not really a business person. I have sold this, ed this, this editor that I make for the Atari ST. We have sold for a while together with somebody else who uh, who had made a Unix shell, and together that was a package. And they sold a few hundred of that, but didn't bring that much money. My big computer uh, algebra program form has been commercial for a while, but it didn't sell that well either, so now it's open source. <laughs> that gives at least more users, because I think that more important than getting some money is that people use it. Yeah? Was a uh, final question here? Right. Also about your covers. I was wondering, did it have a unique solution, or is it possible to reassemble it in a different way? Because if you move, then maybe your new house isn't exactly the same. Now, uh, okay, that is a very good question. I was very lucky because I had made two of them in my old apartment, and they're rather big. Yeah? And so then I moved to my new apartment, and it turned out these two fit exactly on one wall, and just three centimeters spare. <laughs> and the ceiling was exactly the same height. <laughs> So I was very lucky there, otherwise I would have had to shorten in something or something. But of course, I can do that, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, not, not very nice, yeah, because it takes away some of the proportions. 
huh? because you have designed it in such a way that it looks a bit pleasant, the size of the very thing. And if you have to shorten it by 20 centimeters, certainly these things look a bit awkward. Uh, but okay, I was lucky there. <laughs> Okay. I have some spare wood, so <laughs> I can still make some modifications if necessary. Jos, thank you very much. Sure.